Welcome back. Let me start the usual way. Um, what did we talk about last time? What do you remember from the last lecture? We had a guest lecture talk about sort of models and business and, you know, having high, really high fidelity models that are super confusing or super low fidelity Excel models. And there's not really like the right models in the middle uh, that are, are easy to maintain and use and extend. Okay. What does anybody else took away from that guest lecture? I thought the uh, wish lists were, were interesting. Um, and so I think he talked about moving from uh, more of like an application centric design to uh, more of like a data centric one. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, I specifically remember the thing about uh, infrastructure cost and why ML companies aren't as profitable mm -hmm. because of the higher amount of costs they need to uh, pump in mm -hmm. the infrastructure. Right. So the, the thing that stuck to me also the first time he gave the talk was um, the complexity of getting data, right? So the 300 tables and the, what? Well, way more than that, right? The many, many columns distributed all over the place and the difficulty to, to integrate them and load them. And that feeds uh, into our lecture today. So we started also, this was the other part that we talked about um, last time. Um, we motivated one case study um, where you're really processing data at massive scale. Right, so we talked about tagging images in Google Photos, kind of they have this huge amount of pictures that they're getting in and then they have a bunch of machine learning algorithms to detect certain uh, features there that you can search for them. Like in this picture here, search for trees, right? Or search for Pittsburgh or search for a certain location or time. Um, and you don't probably don't want to do all of that search uh, when somebody asks a question. So you need to process the data. And we talked a little bit about different designs, um, uh, speculated a little bit of how you would possibly implement this. And this comes up in a lot of cases. Um, oops, actually. This, is a, this happens when you update the slide just seconds before the lecture. Um, Maybe not. Um, this happens for a lot of cases that you actually need to process data at quite some substantial scale. So um, this is what I wanted to include. Um, I remember this picture, I think on uh, Twitter or so, in the early days of the pandemic, speculating how Zoom must extend their server capacity at any time, right? So because more and more users were using this. But you can think about this as all kinds of different systems. If you're building something like Temi, the transcription service, you need to deal with data that your customers upload and store that, right? And the audio files and the transcriptions. And in the beginning, this probably fits on a single machine. And then you buy another machine. And if you're popular, um, if you have the luck that this actually explodes and lots of people want to use it, right? Then you might get into a situation where you want to add a lot of capacity very quickly. And there's a question of how you do this. So in this lecture, I want to give an overview of kind of different approaches uh, to address da processing data at scale. Look a little bit at machine learning component, but uh, a lot of this is actually kind of orthogonal to machine learning. It's just um, that when we're thinking about machine learning systems, we have a lot of data most of the time. And so we have training data. Um, people often talk about terabytes to petabytes of training data for jobs in big companies. Um, so not 
not the small um, data sets that you have to model Titanic survivors or even the data that I'm giving you for the, um, um, for the movie scenario, but really, really big data sets, right? So you need to store them somewhere first. Then you have input data um, for which you're doing predictions, right? So the data that you're running the inference on, uh, we talked about, what was it? 1.2 billion pictures a day uh, for Google Photos. Right, so those are those many requests you want to do for your prediction service to detect trees potentially. Um, right, so you have a huge amount of input data, and then you also have telemetry data that's probably also or potentially also fairly large. And the models themselves sometimes can be large as well. So you need to have strategies both for storing this huge amount of data and for processing it as well, right? So kind of applying predictions to it, pre-processing, computing, um, whatever. And there's a whole history of kind of thinking about this kind of a database community and there's a huge amount of infrastructure and tools. Um, and I think the, the skill here is in designing a system in picking how to build a scalable systems, figuring out the right components, the right trade-offs, and so on. And so in machine learning systems, you have a lot of training data that you may need to clean, store, and pre-process to extract features at scale, right? Um, you have a lot of um, reads to, um, to the model, lots of predictions, um, um, essentially say, saying the same thing over. And at some point you need to start thinking about distributing it, right? You're extending the scope of a single machine and you're looking into things like distributed data cleaning, distributed feature extraction, distributed learning, uh, distributing the prediction task, the inference uh, task, right? Applying this to every single picture that's coming in um, or having a single big prediction task that may take a long time that you want to predict. Um, like um, doing the transcription for a very long audio file. Maybe you want to chuck it up into pieces and do it in parallel. Um, and then all the telemetry and the logging data that might, again, uh, that you might collect and, and distribute. Um, so if you're scaling, you can only achieve so much, right? You have three main options. You can find more efficient algorithms. You typically hit the ceiling when even linear algorithms aren't fast enough. You can buy faster machines which also hits the ceiling and gets expensive very quickly. And the typical strategy that we go for is having more machines, buying them as cloud resources, um, right? So lots of commodity hardware and just building a distributed system. Um, let, me, let me skip for that a bit. Um, There's lots of basics that we can talk about, but I don't want to spend too much time on those. Um, one of the key assumptions, um, or one of the earlier decisions is about how you store your data. And that has a lot to do with how you can access your data, how you can query it. And so a traditional view uh, model is kind of a relational model. You store everything in tables, and then you have things like uh, SQL uh, to write queries. Um, and kind of a, an engine that knows how to effectively uh, evaluate those queries. Um, data is often indexed so that you can make point queries pretty quickly, right? So a table like this could be terabytes big, could be distributed across multiple machines, but databases can be very efficient at certain search queries if you have indexed the data. And the database can also um, enforce schema consistency, right? So this is something that we talked about in the data quality lecture. Um, for example, making sure that uh, the department that's actually referenced here actually exists and that the user ID is unique, which it isn't in this case for some reason. Um, you probably also have seen document database models, no SQL databases, um, where you just store structured text or structured documents, right? So um, can anybody give me a short pitch why you might want to use those over a relational database? Like the CouchDBs or MongoDBs out there, Heidi? Yeah, so one of the reasons why we might choose uh, 
like this kind of database over relational is we might not exactly know uh, like the data schema that we'll use. So like the data or the, the features might change over time. So the cost of adding more columns or uh, like changing the way the data is stored might be more. So instead, if we had an unstructured uh, uh, like schema, we can make changes easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one reason. Um, you also don't need to think too hard about it. You can kind of um, store nested structures uh, easily, uh, but it's often kind of key value storage. It's less efficient for joins and similar operations that relational databases are uh, optimized for. Um, so they're often simpler. And then you also often have to deal with unstructured data. Log files are common examples, right, where you have tons and tons of CSV files uh, in some format without any, any instructions. Um, by the way, most document databases also can enforce a schema, but most of them don't, um, or most, most users, I think, don't. Um, so there are certain trade-offs. Uh, Vaiti already talked about the benefits or some benefits of um, um, document databases. Any other obvious cases? When would you use just log files? When would you use relational databases? Um, Jake talked about how um, the document databases, you can scale possibly in an easier way, right? Distribution might be somewhat easier, although there are also lots of relational databases that can be um, distributed in some models, but it's, it's yeah, it's potentially more complicated. Um, it's more a trend to have massive relational databases. Anything else? Yeah, data integrity is easier to enforce in relational databases. They're all schema mechanisms for other ones, even for log files, but again, not necessarily used. Um, log files are easy to dump if you don't really care about them right now, but you think you might use them later, right? It's easy to write this. Um, and you, it's really easy to also use document databases in the same way just as a kind of a dump of data and you figure out the schema and how to search for it later. Um, log files are, don't support any indexing. So searching, um, you can search by time, kind of binary search, but that's about it. Um, right, so those are some of the examples. And then data you can encode in many different ways. Again, kind of the data you can encode as plain text, you can encode it in some semi-structured format, um, you can, enforce a schema and that often gives you some encoding. For example, you don't store numbers as, uh, as text anymore, which is kind of inefficient. Like in the log file here, this wastes a lot of space uh, storing numbers as text, right? And then there are formats that actually do binary encodings that are very compact. Photo buffers, I think is one of those uh, things. Uh, so especially if you want to send lots of data over network, there's some um, encoding protocols. So for data storage, there's lots of um, different solutions for distribution. Um, does somebody know the difference between partition and replication? I think this came up in the reading, right? It's been a couple of days since I assigned this, but. So database replication or database partitioning um, or data partitioning, what's the difference? Replication, yes, uh, like mirroring, you put the same data on multiple machines and partitioning. So partitioning is right, dividing a database into parts of the database that you can put on different machines. Uh, do I have an image for this? Right. Um, so partitioning, there are two different forms of partitioning, horizontal and vertical. Um, the 
common horizontal form is that you take a database with lots of rows and you put some rows on one machine and some rows on the other machine. Um, for example, yeah, movies by decade, uh, decade or hashing, right? So I could put all my data on certain kinds of old movies on one machine and newer movies on a different machine or in a shopping database, um, something like Amazon relating to different centers or different warehouses on different machines. Um, that's horizontal partitioning. And vertical partitioning would be cutting off certain um, columns or parts of a, a data set. Right, so for example, I have the movie title, but all the information I have about actors, which is potentially pretty big, I put on a different machine. Um, replication is when you store the same data on multiple machines. Often you have partitioning and a replication in some combination. Um, and there are many different ways of handling this. I don't wanna to go too deep into this. Um, this is something useful to know about when you're building these kind of systems to read up on. The book that I assigned for reading, I think it gives actually a very good overview of different designs. It's technology independent, um, kind of independent of specific implementations so that you can pick an implementation that matches your concepts. Um, so a common strategy is that you have one leader database um, that has a ground truth and then some replications, followers that get copies of that database. The advantage here is um, that you can always read from any database. The disadvantage is that you tend to write only to the leader database, um, right? So if somebody needs to decide if there are multiple competing rights, which one wins which one is first. The pro there are lots of problems with this distribution of in distributed systems, that if somebody writes a value to this database and somebody writes a different value to this database at the same time, which one is the correct value, right? And what you want to avoid is that every database thinks a different, or every copy thinks a different value is correct. You want consistency across the database uh, or across all copies. One way of achieving this is to have a primary database and all writes go to this, and then you copy data from this and everybody can read from everything, essentially. There are multiple different designs here. Um, there's multi-leader re uh, replication uh, where you can write to multiple different leaders, uh, but you need to deal with uh, write conflicts. There are multiple ways of doing this again. Um, for example, you can write certain things only to certain uh, leaders or you need to um, have some voting mechanisms between the leaders. So there's some synchronization that at least the majority of the re uh, leaders need to know about this. Or you have strategies, um, I think I have this in here as well, um, um, where you have eventual consistency. Um, so you might have slow inconsistencies, but if, uh, mechanisms to resolve them eventually. Do I really wanna go into this? Um, so the one strategy is uh, that you always write to all at the same time. Um, another strategy is that you have transactions where you lock things, uh, they're distributed transactions. Um, there are lots of difficulties here. Anime brings up the cap theorem. Um, it's well known that you can't have um, consistency, atomicity, and uh, persistence at the same time. So you always have to give up something. There might be inconsistencies in the database or you may have uh, effects that are not atomic. Um, so um, if you write two things together, only one might be successful, the other one might not. Or you might have things that you write and they are overwritten or you have kind of short-term inconsistencies. Different databases have different strategies to deal with this. There are lots of different trade-offs. Um, if you're interested, I can spend more time in a future lecture to talk about this, um, but otherwise this is, this is mostly fairly well understood. Lots of kind of trade-offs and I think it's more a question of what you pick for your specific problem. Any questions, comments quickly on this? All right. With this, I wanna to switch to kind of data processing and especially talk about batch processing with stream processing. We talked about this briefly before um, when we talked about the Google 
uh, example um, at the end of the last lecture. So you can often think about this as three different forms of processing. You have services where you do uh, processing on demand. So a web server would answer immediately. Um, you, you make a request. I'm asking for a movie recommendation from your service. You compute this on demand immediately, send it back. Batch processing is the idea that you run large computations, typically in intervals at some point offline. Right? So you pre-compute data. It's not necessarily the freshest as from whenever you ran this last, but you can do this on things on large, large data sets. It may take a couple of minutes or hours or even days to run, um, and then you get a, get a result. And stream processing is somewhere in the middle. The idea is that you have something near real time, but you don't get immediate answers back. Right? So you put events in a queue or data in a queue, and then you have items that kind of process this queue one step at a time. Let's look at them a little bit more in detail. I think the, the service part is, is easy, right? That's straightforward. Batch processing, um, I suspect most of, of you have seen this in one form or another. Um, let's start with very simple large jobs. Does anybody know what the code here is doing? Can somebody read bash scripts? Roughly, can somebody think aloud? Let's think about the first five unique records in this log. No. So, can you, can everybody read the basic thing what's happening here? So, there's multiple tools that are kind of sequenced, right? So, you have uh, one operation that produces data, and then the next operation takes that data, produces other data, and so on. Right? So it's kind of pipe operations. The first thing here um, just outputs a text file, um, a log file here. This command extracts the seventh element in each row. Let's say it's the, um, when this is a, access log, I think in the example, this was a web server. Let's say this is the URL, right? So after these two commands, we get a file that has all the URLs or all the files on the web server that have ever been accessed, right? Everything else got thrown away. So this data set is much, much smaller than this because we threw away all the dates and all the users and things like this. What are these two lines doing? Uh, sorting, then get rid of the replicas. Right, so sorting and counting. So this counts how frequently each line occurs in there. So it's an aggregation. In SQL, you would do something grouped by, so get the, sub, the, the count grouped by something. So the unique command will just count how many lines in a row have the same value. And so that you can count things, you first need to sort this. This is a common Unix pattern. Uh, you sort things that all the URLs are always next to each other if the same URLs uh, requested multiple times, and then you count how often. So what we're doing here is we're counting which URL is how often it has been accessed. And then this one here is sorting the result again, um, sorting by the number that the previous result produced. So we're, we're sort and, and sorting re in reverse. So we are starting with the most accessed um, files first, and then we're just taking the first five results. Right, so what this thing is doing, it takes a massive log file, it extracts the URLs or the file names, it counts how often each file is occurring in this thing, 
and then it reports the five most common things. This is a job that potentially takes quite a while, right? So if, you, if your script is big, this takes quite a while. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we often do, filtering, sorting, aggregating, right? Counting something, counting occurrences, sorting something. A lot of these operations are actually quite expensive, right? Sorting or aggregation is expensive. Aggregation is cheap once you have sorted it, but sorting is expensive on large data, right? And this is often done to produce reports, to produce models. Um, and this is done on a single pro in a single process. Or, I mean, you can kind of start with the second tool when the first tool is running for some tools, but it's, it's kind of on a single machine, um, on a single data file. And now you want to kind of do something similar at a much, la much larger scale. And this is essentially where MapReduced, uh, MapReduce and frameworks like this come in. Right, so MapReduce tasks are typically quite similar. You have some data, for example, massive logs data that uh, is scattered across many machines. You extract all the files that have been accessed. You count them. You count them on each machine separately. Then you aggregate them. You reduce it, so kind of ship the partial results from all the machines together. Right. So the, the first map task might be on this on each machine, um, get all the URLs and count them. Then you get some intermediate results. They are much, much shorter than the original data. So you ship them around. You aggregate them you reduce them and you get the end result, right? And potentially you do this over multiple stages. Um, the key idea here is that you process data locally at the storage. You ship computation to the storage rather than shipping the data around because the data is so massive. Whereas the program here, that's just a few lines of some code, right? Some aggregation. So the common approach that MapReduce does is it moves data, uh, it moves computation to the sources. Not all computation can be done locally on a subset of the data, right? But a lot of this can be. Um, if you look back at this result here, this stuff can be done separately on all subsets of the log files. Right? We, can, we can divide the log files into five files and do this separately. Sorting we can't do on, on just a subset. <clears throat> For sorting, we need the global uh, view. But what we can do is we can, because we're, we're counting essentially, right? we're sorting just to count, we can count locally and then add the counts for multiple subsets together in a separate step. So uh, if you want to distribute this, you know that you can do the data extraction and the counting here, and then the rest of the counting on the subset of the data. Right, so this is a fairly common design pattern to run big jobs to paralyze them, right? If you have massive distributed data, bring the computation to the data, try to compute as much locally as possible, ship the results around, then compute on the results again, uh, and continue and continue. There are several frameworks for this. Um, Hadoop is the most common one, uh, I think, is an open source framework. The, the thing that the MapReduce framework does, it gives you all the plumbing and the error handling, right? So, the problem with distributed systems is that where you had one machine before that could fail, now you have maybe a few hundred machines and one of them will fail, right? So as soon as one of these workers here goes down, you kind of need to start it again, otherwise you're missing part of the data. So what a MapReduce framework like Hadoop will do is it will manage the overview, it will orchestrate what's computed where, has the computation completed? If not, has it failed? Do we need to restart it, right? It's, an, it's a fairly nice framework. You can just compute, uh, recompute some of these things um, if something fails. Does it make sense? So this is, I think, the typical structure how you want to think about MapReduce, kind of massive um, jobs that you can distribute. There are a couple of assumptions here. Uh, you kind of need a functional programming style which fits well to kind of the shell programming thing. So you need immutable inputs. So if you compute the same thing again, the inputs haven't changed. 
Um, from inputs, you produce outputs. You're not modifying the inputs, right? So this is also common for shell commands. You read something, you produce a new output, you write it somewhere else, and you tend to avoid side effects. Um, so things like printing something is something that you don't do, uh, or writing results that you use in the next query is something that you don't do. And because of this, because of the functional nature here, which kind of limits what you can do, but it's, um, if it fits this functional nature, it's really easy to repeat jobs on crashes or parts of jobs, it's easy to roll back, and it's easy to decide what can be run in parallel and what can't. Debugging is really annoying because things no longer fail locally. They fail in, in distributed places. There's a bunch of infrastructure again to help you debug. Um, this is where a lot of in infrastructure investment comes from, which is why you also probably don't want to build your own MapReduce system, but build on an existing infrastructure that handles all the plumbing for you. So let's think back, let's get it back to you. Um, think back to the um, uh, Google Photos scenario. What kind of things would you compute with batch processing in that kind of scenario? Where might this be appropriate? So, so um, Citron talks about kind of non-machine learning use cases like aggregating user statistics each day. Yes, that's like a daily report on something is very similar to the log file analysis, right? So you could just look at the 1.2 billion pictures a day and kind of collect when have they been uploaded or how many users, things like this. And then Chris talks about updating tags on existing pictures, right? So if, if you don't need this immediately, but maybe you have trained a new model and you want to go over all the data, right? This is a potentially fairly easy to paralyze job where you have a distributed data storage of all images and you apply a new model and update the corresponding data for everything. Um, right, so I think, where classic uh, MapReduce jobs often are multi-stages, at least the way that they are taught, right? You can have these jobs where it's just one expensive task that you run over a large amount of data. And again, kind of tagging images is the same idea where you move the computation to the data, right? Even if you have a model that's 500 megabytes, moving the model to the data is probably cheaper than moving all the data to your model, right? Um, 1.2 billion pictures, are not small. Um, um, Jake, can you expand a little bit? Oh, just I was um, suggesting that, um, that perhaps you might be able to use the MapReduce for a neural network, but I clarified to say not for training it, because mm -hmm. if you're using gradient descent or something, you're not going to be able to distribute the task. You actually are. I'm going to talk about this later. It's 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 weird, but this is this is how a lot of these systems work these days. Um, I haven't really seen distributed inference in the sense that you split a model into smaller pieces and kind of send parts of the picture to different places. Um, typically, the data is much bigger than the models. Um, but yeah, maybe um, I'm also not sure that I know know all of this there. Could you do like almost a random forest in a distributed way where you distribute or you train a whole bunch of um, decision trees and then your inference model really just sends the input to all those trees and somehow aggregates the re response? Yep. Um, I'm not sure that the network overhead is worth it in, yeah. uh, it might be, um, but most decision trees are relatively small and cheap to evaluate, I would guess, mm -hmm. right? That you might not want to do the network traffic, but yeah. Let me actually just jump to, um, to distribute the training since you're, you're bringing it up. Um, this is something, 
uh, has been influential. Actually, the original paper is from Google and some CMU folks um, on the parameter server architecture. So this is, um, I think they knew already how to do distributed training of deep neural networks, but this is this was an approach to scale it up quite a bit more. I'm not going to explain this in detail, but just showing it's not traditional MapReduce, um, but there is distributed learning, distributed training for machine learning data. Um, just briefly remember how uh, training uh, deep neural networks work. You have, all, you have these networks and each of these units has one parameter in it, or no, each of these edges, sorry. Uh, each of these edges corresponds to one number, right? So you multiply the incoming value by this weight and then you sum all those weights, uh, you get, you have some kind of cutoff function, you get the resulting, you multiply this by a weight again and so on. And the way that training works is you compute all the, all the activations forward, then you compare the result against the expected result, right? It might be the wrong classification. And if it's wrong, if it's far away from the expected result, if your loss is too bad, uh, you go back through the network and compute which weights you should change, right? So you typically, so you compute the gradients, you figure out this weight should be a little bit higher, this weight should be a little bit smaller, this weight should be a little bit higher and so on, right? And you just incrementally adjust the weights a little bit and you do this, you continue doing this until the model stabilizes, right? Until when you train more and more and more, it kind of uh, averages out and stabilizes, it converges. Make sense? So the question now is how can you distribute this? Right, so you have massive amounts of training data. So you definitely want to distribute this. So the paper um, is from 2014 and it cited terabytes to petabytes of training data back then. And we talked about the size of these parameters, right? So that just the parameters alone could be a terabyte of or a half a terabyte or a terabyte of data of some of these big models. So you don't necessarily want to send them around. So distributed gradient descent is in general not super hard. So what you're doing is you have a bunch of workers um, that essentially get some of your training data. So this, this is indicating kind of the rows of training data. You have some weights, you compute the activations, uh, you compute the corrections, and then you send the corrections back to one central server that knows all the weights. And you can do this in parallel. The, the original learning algorithm is sequential, right? So what can happen is that you're learning some, uh, some weight adjustments here that are overwritten by some weight adjustments here. So typically you're sending back the adjustments like plus 0.1, minus plus uh, 0.1, and then you just aggregate them here. This is not strictly the same as learning sequentially, but you get similar enough results. Does it make sense? Jake is shaking his head. <laughs> okay. Um, the problem with this approach is that you're sending massive amounts of data across everything. So the pushes here is you're sending a bunch of uh, updates to all the weights, right? So if you have like these huge numbers of weights, you're sending potentially half a terabyte of data in terms of updates, and then you're sending them back, you're sending the adjusted weights back, and this can be very expensive. So they've actually pushed this further, and I don't wanna go into the details and I haven't looked into them in too much detail, but there's a huge amount of engineering that went into figuring out to send only the relevant data back and forth. So, Often when you're training, you're not adjusting all the parameters, you're just adjusting some parameters. So instead of sending the entire vector or the entire matrix over, you're just sending parts of the data structure over. So there's quite a bit of engineering to make this, um, this transfer of parameter data much more efficient to only look at the parameters that you need to have more clever, clever merging and so on. So in the end, it looks, it's not quite MapReduce, 
Um, it's called the, uh, the parameter server. You actually have typically multiple servers that only store part of the model or part of the parameters. You have the workers, and then you have some efficient kind of uh, communication between the parameter server and the workers that just talk about kind of some, some parameters are updated and so on. The thing where it's kind of similar is that this feels like a MapReduce framework in that the framework takes a, a care of a lot of the plumbing. It again figures out what happens when any of those servers go down. There's some replication, right? So the parameters are not just stored on a single parameter server, but are multiple. The workers are monitored the entire time. If something crashes, you restart it and so on. Um, so, but it still has kind of the feel of a batch job in that you have a massive learning job. You're distributing your training data. You probably move the workers to your training data, right? They're smaller than the data most of the time. Um, and then you're thinking about how, how are you shipping data around? There's a lot of discussion there in kind of trading of different qualities like reliability and how quickly you, um, you kind of converge. Um, things like this. I doubt that this is something that you will ever really care about unless you kind of go into operations in designing a system, right? But I think it's useful to think about, yes, there are distributed abstractions also for the learning part itself. And there's a massive amount of kind of engineering and research going into this. There's actually, if you're interested, a specific conference these days that just focuses on the system aspects of machine learning. Um, this is on the academic side, but it really thinks about kind of systems in terms of networks and hardware and how can we support machine learning tasks at scale. Um, there's quite a bit of attention in this area these days. Any questions? Oops. Um, then let me go back to batch processing. So I think most of the time we will probably use batch processing to apply predictions to a lot of data, right? Kind of have a lot of input data to apply to a prediction algorithm um, or just in general data processing, right? computing statistics, computing things from telemetry, um, and so on. Um, there are lots of data flow engines. Hadoop is kind of aging, I think, in many people's mind. It's, it's focused on this very kind of narrow MapReduce abstraction. Um, there are many engines, um, data flow engines are typically called kind of where you pipe computations into other computations that get a lot of attention. Spark is one of them, uh, does essentially in mem memory computation and kind of clever sh moving around computations and data. Um, Tess and Flink are other ones. I don't know most of those systems in, in detail. Um, but these are all kind of big systems that are popular and broadly used. Um, they give often a lot of flexibility, do a lot of plumbing in many different ways um, to run big jobs. Right, but I think a key principle is always you have data distributed and you move computations to the data as much as you can. And Depending on the engine, you need to think harder or less about how much, how much you need to get involved. Any questions on this part? Otherwise, I'm going to streams. So stream processing is essentially the Kafka's out there, right? So you've seen this through Kafka. Um, I'm writing stuff in there. You can read this. Multiple can read from the same stream. Um, you can process an, a message as it comes in. For example, one thing that I expect a lot of you will do or will start doing at some point is to subscribe to my stream and just take all the rating uh, entries and throw everything away, right? So that you get, you process the ratings and not the rest. And it doesn't really matter that you do this immediately in real time, right? So I can write to the stream. I don't have to wait for you to process this. Um, 
but it's often in near real time. And if your system crashes, then there's a backlog and it just starts up and you process the backlog. Right, so this is a pretty good picture. So it's an event-based system. Um, if you've taken architectures before, think of this as a published subscribe system, right? Pub sub architecture, message, message passing style. Um, so there are many different systems around there. Kafka is kind of maybe a somewhat strange design in that it focuses heavily on persistent data. Um, so it kind of is a mix between a database and a message passing system, but they are often kind of similar. So you have producers that send messages to topics. You have consumers that can read messages from topics, right? Classic pub sub system. Uh, this way you decouple producers from consumers. This is also something that we saw in the shell architecture, right? So the, the sort command doesn't need to know where the data is coming from. Um, and you also decouple it in, in terms of time, right? So if a message producer is faster than a consumer, messages will be buffered up to the point that the buffer overflows. What happens if the buffer overflows? If the producer is way, way faster than the consumer? Anybody dealt with any of those systems? So it really depends on the on the message on the system. So you can do different things. You can discard messages. You can refuse to accept messages. Kind of throw an uh, throw an exception when you write something. Silently discard messages. You can also, instead of just rejecting exception, you can work with the producer and start slowing down the producer, giving him the producer a signal, I can't accept anything. That's often called back pressure, um, that you kind of design the system, that the producer, oh, producer, stop for a second. Um, this is really lots of, um, there are many different strategies and it kind of depends on what your use case is. Um, so in robotic system, for example, um, they use this for internal message passing as well. They just drop messages. If it's older than a few milliseconds, it doesn't matter anyway. Um, so they just drop them. Um, Kafka has a strategy where they have a massive buffer typically, but if you're way behind and the buffer gets emptied, um, you might, might lose messages as well. Right. So Depending on the system, messages get removed when they are consumed or after a timeout. Um, Kafka actually keeps messages. Um, a lot of uh, other message passing system will remove them once they are consumed. Um, and there are some systems that use a central broker, some without, and many, many different uh, error handling strategies. A lot, again, is in the plumbing of how do you deal with distributed systems, how you scale this to massive scale, right, where you have maybe a leader, multiple replica um, uh, replications, and so on. So the way that you end up using them is kind of like shell uh, scripts where you have a system that passes some input and it writes output into a different thing. So I didn't have a good exam, uh, picture here, so I, I used something that I wrote myself, um, has nothing to do with machine learning, I think. It's something where we run GitHub analysis at scale. So we're downloading data from GitHub. So I, I actually start with a stream of projects that I'm uh, analyzing. I'm downloading issues for those. So I have a, I have a project that's taking an input stream of this is the next uh, project that I should analyze. I'm downloading the issues. I'm writing this into a new stream with the issues. And now I have multiple tools that are reading this stream to process those issues. For example, check whether they have been uh, deleted, whether there's something uh, removed or so. And in the end, there's a different stream different thing that just takes those issues and writes them into a database. And all of these things work at different speeds. Um, so issue, uh, GitHub is rate limited, so I can ask about one, one query per second. Uh, and some of these computations are fairly expensive, like detecting deleted issues. I need to ask more queries. I need to ask a database and so on. So this is fairly slow. 
So they all work at different speeds and I can also decide to add more consumers and producers later and so on. Right? So a lot of this doesn't have to be real time actually. Right? But you can think of something like this also, do I have this here um, in a machine learning context, right? So how would you use, this is probably too easy, but how would you use a streaming system uh, in the Google Photos scenario? Could you stream photos to do the predictions for like updating the labels? Yeah. So, so I would expect that you put all the incoming uh, photos in a stream, right? In, in one topic, um, in a queue essentially. And then you have one or multiple workers that just always take the next part of a, of a queue, make some predictions, write those predictions either to a different queue that gets written to the database or write it directly to the database. Um, you can probably also do multiple steps of processing where you maybe take multiple, um, you have some prediction model that looks like an image, uh, produces some output, and then you have a second prediction model that takes the output and produces a new output. Um, And you can have multiple consumers again, right? So you may have one input stream of all, the, of all the photos, and then you can have multiple different mechanisms, one that's tagging trees, one that's uh, adding the location, that's looking up kind of, this is a coordinates, and this is in these and these and these locations, right? Um, you may have another thing that compares it to the previous or the next pictures to detect whether you should do some panorama picture or whether you should detect friends, things like this, right? So you, again, you decouple this. It's very easy to add or remove certain consumers. It's also easy to add more producers, right? So if you have more ways that photos can come in from multiple endpoints and you don't need the, you don't need uh, feedback immediately, right? Um, can actually, I wasn't planning on this, but I have this open right now because I was showing you the other thing. Um, let me see. I have this dashboard from the GitHub issues. If this opens, everything gets slow if Zoom is running. So this is my download of issues. As I said, about one a second, and then at some point, once an hour, the rate limit runs low. And I'm processing things in different speeds. So here's the queue of things that I'm processing, um, or the speed that I'm processing this. I have a massive backlog of things where I need to figure out um, how, uh, whether they are deleted or not. Um, whereas writing this into a database is super fast. So that I rarely ever have a backlog here of messages. So this one says how many messages I have or how fast I'm analyzing this. Um, and you can see or not see depending on whether this ever works. Um, yeah, a bunch of these workers, this is a throughput of individual workers work at the same speed as the original um, downloading mechanisms and some of them like detecting deleted things. The speed is pretty much independent of how, how fast the other thing works. And this is just all, um, this is, this is all decoupled, right? So I can, if one of these workers also crashes, I can just restart it. If one is too slow, I can just start multiple copies of it. Um, so, there are some nice benefits of, of doing this. Um, and there are a bunch of different designs. Uh, let's see. One of the big design question is how do you deal with lost messages? Um, again, assume this is a distributed system. So the server could do go down at any point in time. Um, you typically can't guarantee that every message is pro processed exactly once, 
you either have to accept that you may lose certain messages so they are never processed or that you may process multiple messages, uh, messages multiple times. Um, you typically can't guarantee in a, in a distributed system that everything is processed exactly when. So that's again the cap theorem in the end. And so one fallback strategy is that um, you want to process each message at least once so that nothing ever gets lost, which means that you may process it multiple times. So if you're tagging images in Google, that probably doesn't matter when you compute the tags multiple times, right? You probably compute the same tags, you just overwrite them, it's fine. What you want to avoid is probably that you have some images that are strangely not tagged for users. But there are also messages that you maybe never want to produce a uh, process multiple times. Any ideas of examples? What's a message where it's better to lose it than to, than to process it multiple times? Think about operations that destroy data or money. I was gonna say like an emergency response thing. Like you don't wanna process an old emergency response and if you miss the data, probably somebody else will submit another one or something like that. Yeah. Um, um, a banking system where you send payment, you probably don't just, because the server gets goes down, send the same payment multiple times, you probably want somebody to explain, a uh, complain that they didn't receive their pay payment and just submit another one. Um, things where you mutate data, um, so you, you do kind of a plus one operation, but you, you care about the precise result. Um, you can often think around this, like have some, some confirmation through some other channel where you see, oh, this wasn't eventually processed. Um, but in the process, things may kind of fall down, get restarted and so on. You kind of, one of the big design decisions is about how to deal with this and different systems allow different mechanisms. Often this is a parameter or this is a design decision in how you're, um, how you're sending or receiving messages. In Kafka, for example, you can just send messages without waiting for confirmation, which is way, way faster than sending it and waiting for confirmation. If you get a confirmation, Kafka guarantees that it's in the system and won't be lost. And as a consumer, um, I don't know whether you made an explicit decision, but you need to decide when to commit offsets, right? So the consumer reads something and then updates um, which things they have read. And the default setting, I think, is an auto commit offset. So you're reading something and it will automatically send back that you've read it. Um, but you can design this in different ways. So for example, you can only update the offset after you're done processing. So if you're crashing while you're processing, you would get the same message again because the offset hasn't been updated. Or you can decide um, you commit immediately when you're reading that this has been read so that something can't be read twice. And then you might crash in processing and you may lose information. So I suspect I'm losing a bunch of you here because I'm talking ab abstractly about this. Um, the details don't matter too much. Uh, the key point here is designing these systems is hard, but there are known trade-offs, known design principles. And when you're ever dealing with something like this, it's a distributed system, so you need to deal with unanticipated errors in weird ways. And you kind of need to think about what can happen and what kind of backup mechanisms do you have in there. Um, and then read up on this when you need it. Again, the book um, that I recommended and that I assigned the first chapter for is really good at explaining kind of these trade-offs, explaining the fundamental algorithms without committing itself to a single tool, right? So we talked about this. Um, this is one last thing that I wanna talk about. Um, 
Do we have any fans of functional programming in the room? Um, there are people that are convinced that mutable state is the root of all evil, evil in computer science, right? And that everything becomes so much easier if you don't have side effects, if everything is, is a pure function and so on. There's a similar idea in databases. Um, like traditional databases are mutable state. Um, you have a database, you can always change values, delete something, add something, modify it. Uh, you don't have a history, right? So in a typical database, there's a log um, that's usually used for um, recovery if the database crashes, but most of the time you can't go back in time, right? It's, it's not like a Git which keeps the entire history of your file for forever. So there's a concept in, in, in databases that becomes more and more popular also because it's kind of useful in a lot of scenarios in kind of big data systems and machine learning systems um, where you have append only databases. You only, like log files, you only write to the end. You never modify existing data. The technical term that's mostly used for this is event sourcing, uh, where you, instead of writing data, the final results, you write events that update the data. So down here is an example of creating a user, then updating a user by changing the department, for example. So I'm not going back to the table and actually change it. I'm just saying the data that I've stored previously has changed. And if I'm deleting something, I'm not actually deleting any rows. I'm just adding an extra line that it has been changed. So traditional databases do this often already as a log, but again, mostly as a, a recovery mechanism. So the, those logs get purged at some point. Um, if, you, if you want to know the current state, like which department is a user in, potentially you have to go throughout the entire log and compute the state, right? See where the user was created, see all the updates to get the last value. An advantage that you have, it's really easy to point to a specific point in time and say, this was my state at this point in time, right? I can say the database yesterday belonged to entry 5,321, right? So, and everything that comes after this was changed afterward. You might even be able to say who has changed something. It gives you a very clear kind of provenance of your data, kind of who has changed things. We'll come back to some of this for provenance later. So for machine learning, it's really annoying um, to figure out if what, like, especially if you have production data that you update, what data was a model trained on? Um, if data is changed in a big database, like sales uh, change from day to day, right? So you're doing predictions of, uh, inventory, of an inventory system. Um, if your input data changes from day to day and you train a different model, it's very hard to debug because it's very hard to figure out what data was this precisely trained on. Event sourcing makes it easy because you just say the data at this specific point in time. Right? So you can associate a model with a single a number, a single pointer into your database um, to reproduce the training data at that point. Um, so there are a number of benefits here. Um, all history stored, it's recoverable. Versioning is really easy. You can compute multiple views also if you, um, that's maybe the, the main drawback. Um, if you want the current state, you need to go through all of this. You don't want to do this. So what people do is they compute views on the data. So um, you could have a streaming system, for example, that computes the current view of the data, the current snapshot, what would be in a database. And whenever a new event comes in, you update the view, right? If you ever lose the view, you can just go over the entire data to recompute it. Um, but to do efficient queries, you typically want a view and you may want different views. Um, yeah, this is just an example of how you would do it. Um, 
this is does this idea of event sourcing make sense? Any questions on this? What are some advantages that you can think of of having this kind of model, kind of immutable data? It's expensive to get to the current state. Yes, any other problems you can see? You have more data, yes. Um, you might struggle with high write environments, yes. Although it's often easier to scale databases this way because you only append, you don't need, never need to go back and search for things in an index and modify existing pages. Um, any other things? Let me just drop the keyword privacy. Any ideas? If you make mistakes, uh, you need to have another update afterward to correct the mistakes. Yeah, you're never deleting anything. Um, for privacy, also the thing that I wanted to get at is you can essentially not delete data, right? So you can mark data as deleted, but you will never get rid of it. So if you're by law required to remove certain data, this kind of breaks your model, right? Um, which is a problem in general, um, kind of deleting data is hard, but in this, this model kind of assumes that you never delete anything, you, or that marking it as deleted is fine. Um, this brings me to the last point for today. Um, this is a big buzzword, um, the Lambda architecture. Uh, just by show of hands, who has heard of the Lambda architecture before? Uh, less than half, okay. Um, so the Lambda architecture is an idea to combine immutable data with stream processing, with batch processing, essentially. So the idea, this picture is terrible, but um, let's talk about this. So no, let's go two steps further. This picture is better. Um, you assume you have incoming data um, you have a server that you're operating that's producing log files, for example. The log files go into a streaming service. So the stream will process things at near, um, should have practiced preparing, uh, explaining this. Um, let me step, step back. So you have three, th three layers um, that people talk about. The serving layer answers questions immediately. The stream layer answers questions or updates things in near real time. And the last layer, the um, batch layer, computes things in regular intervals. So an idea is if you have a stream of data coming in, if you need to answer a question immediately, you need to kind of deal with some serving st structure, but most of the time you don't need the uh, latest, most up-to-date result. You can always go back to kind of the traditional big batch system and you learn overnight or you, you compute something overnight. And then the idea is to have this layer with stream processing in the middle that does incremental updates in near real time. So an idea, an example could be you're producing a big um, report that computes how many pages are seen how often. Um, you compute this once overnight on all the log files from yesterday. And then every time a new user clicks on a web page, you update your report in the streaming process. It's almost real time, but you don't need to block um, the execution, right? So you don't do this in kind of a service layer. You don't respond immediately. 
but you kind of put the log files into a stream and then you process it like once a second or maybe with a five second delay and update your model. And once you, or, or your report, and once you have the report that you can send back immediately and uh, the result that you get from the report is near real time. The advantage is that even if the stream processing here may lose some messages once in a while, right? So we have those consistency issues. It doesn't matter too much because we're losing some small updates, some small inconsistencies, and overnight we're going to recompute everything from the entire log base. So the next day we, we're starting with, with the fixed versions. So the, the errors that you're getting from stream processing never amount too much. That's the idea. Does this make sense? So um, in machine learning, what you can do, I've shown this here before, um, for example, you can learn a model every night and then you adjust the model with some incremental learning as data comes in. The incremental learning might not be as good as the original learning because maybe it biases the model or it might overfit or something like this. This assumes that you have a model that you can incrementally train, right? Um, but it's, it's good enough to make quick adjustments to the model in near real time. And then overnight, you're recomputing the entire thing from scratch to get a better model with all the updated data. Right, and the predictions you do with the model, um, with the, which has been updated over time. Right, so in terms of just explaining jargon, so people talk of the best, uh, the batch layer, which does Hadoop style kind of batch processing. You look at all the data, you recompute it periodically. And because you're looking at all data, it's typically saying this is the best accuracy, but it's producing data that's potentially old by the time it's done. The speed layer is a streaming layer. So it's stream processing, incremental updates, often you approximate results. So it's less, often less accurate. It's just kind of quick updates. And the serving layer is the one that produces the results or that reports the results um, that are produced by the other two layers. To make this work, you want append-only data, right? You want immutable data because you want to be able to recompute everything overnight, um, or at least you want it in this format. Um, you can do tasks with varying um, with varying latency, right? So the speed layer can do some quick approximations and the, the expensive results you, uh, you run overnight. And you can kind of balance latency, throughput and fault tolerance in potentially interesting ways. Mohanesh. Um, so I was wondering, can we say that uh, this sort of architecture is only useful in use cases where uh, you need that incremental learning to to happen uh, at a very uh, fast pace. Yes. Uh, you need your model to adapt, like something in the financial market uh, modeling or something like that. Yes. Okay. yes. So traditionally, I think this comes from reporting, or this would be the more traditional use case, I think. You could generate reports, like a sales report or kind of um, web logs or kind of a dashboard. Um, right, but in the machine learning context, this is useful if you want to do incremental learning. Uh, there are lots of use cases for this and lots and lots of scenarios where you don't need this. Correct. Okay, thanks. Another buzzword here is data lake. Um, does somebody know what this means? Have you seen the term so, before? Um, my understanding is you have data lakes and data warehouses and so a data lake would be um, a large collection of, of data from different sources, but not particularly organized. Yeah. And then when it's, once you organize it and it's more interoperable with itself, then that would be more of a data warehouse structure. Right, so, so data warehouse, uh, I'm, I'm running out of time. I did have a segment on this, but I don't think it's too important. A data ware warehouse is a typically a big, structured table that has, uh, that's useful for pre-computing 
certain information. So what you typically do is you have lots of databases and you care about sales in certain regions or so. You're extracting all the relevant data into one big table. It's typically something that doesn't change, right? So it doesn't change from transaction to transaction. You do this once a day. And then you're computing a view, that, which is sometimes also called a data mart. Um, so this is a massive pre-computation of a view. And a data lake is typically not as, so this is structured. This is like a relational database that's often denormalized, but um, um, doesn't matter too much for this purpose. Uh, let me go back now. Where am I? I lost track of where I am. Um, in, in a data lake, you typically just have unstructured data. So piles and piles of log files or databases in different formats. The idea comes essentially from the idea data is valuable, even if it's just stupid log files. Maybe we don't know how to use it yet, but maybe we use it in the future. Let's just keep it all, right? Data is a new oil. Let's, let's kind of just amass it all. It's not clear that we're ever going to use all of this, but maybe there are some useful nuggets in there that we can use later. So it's fairly common for a lot of companies that just store all of their data in a fairly unstructured format. Just keep all the, this all in log files. Um, often these are log files um, in the case that it might be useful later. Um, just assuming data storage is cheap, right? So if we're wondering next year, or oh, had we only kept that data, then we could have made the super business use case and implemented this new feature. This is essentially just assuming um, that, um, yeah, it's cheap enough to store and we can go back to it if we need to. So it's quite common to kind of, if you have a data stream like Kafka, that you just write the result of log files or so in a pile and store it somewhere. Right, so you have processed it, you may not have immediate needs for it. Um, you could also write it in a normal database um, or you can write it into a more structured um, data warehouse system that actually is optimized for queries. Um, I just wanted to essentially run the, the, the buzzword by you because data lake is something that you almost certainly are going to see if you're going anywhere in this area, kind of big data. Um, same as Lambda architecture, Th those are kind of very common words um, and common, common styles to think about this as kind of something that does fast processing on massive amounts of data. Um, one thing that happens very quickly is that you might lose an overview of what's, what's all the data that you have, right? So it's very common to have this pile of <clears throat> data files and then you write into a different database. So this is where it's really useful to start some documentation, um, kind of document how data is flowing to the system. I was so glad that I had this when I looked at my project again after a year and set this up again because I had no idea what I was running and what was consuming what data and writing where. And going back to, to last week's um, um, guest uh, lecture, um, Molham was talking about how companies have all these different data sources and they're producing them in, in many different forms, right? So this is a database, uh, traditional databases, you shift them into some other forms. They come, there's some streaming platforms in here where data might come in from different sources, right? And you're kind of processing this over and over again until you get to some, um, something that you can actually use as input for a model or that you're producing for some reporting. All right, I'm out of time. Um, I had some other stuff that's less important, I think. Um, let me just briefly summarize. Um, I wanted to get you a sense of what are the things to care about if you're working with massive amounts of data, which you're very likely to do if you're dealing with machine learning. Right, so you have massive amounts of training data, inference data, telemetry data, and even the models become big at some point. And you really need to think about some sort of distribution, distributed storage and component. It's really useful to think about common design patterns like batch processing, stream processing, Lambda architecture, and just use tools that have been developed for this. 
there's a huge amount of engineering and plumbing that goes into those tools. So understanding them is an investment, but it's probably much, much better than rolling your own. Um, so this is what I wanted to cover today. Um, and if you have two more minutes, I can talk a little bit more about how I changed assignments. Um, so I push, I changed the, um, I changed the schedule a little bit and pushed a bunch of assignments back. I was realizing that I had the midterm now and then um, the holiday weekend and then assignment due next week and I didn't want to do that. So I pushed everything back a little bit um, and I made the last assignment a part of the group project a little bit shorter to compensate for this. Um, so there's no immediate assignment due for next Tuesday. I would suggest if you have some room so the next assignment, I'm going to release it to, tonight, but it's for, for two weeks, um, is an individual project, but I would suggest to keep working with your team um, if you have some room to, to work on the next milestone that this is not pushing it. Also, because of this, we have some time in the schedule. So if you're feeling you're behind with the first milestone of the team project, send me an email and I think we can be kind of open to some extension, except that this kind of moves into the midterm, which I don't really want to do. But um, I, I'm flexible on this thing. And so I just wanted to mention this. I won't see you on Thursday because you're writing an exam and then have a good holiday weekend and then see you next week. All right, see ya. <laughs>